again, everybody. We're going to talk here about surgical problems during the infancy period. I divided the pediatric surgery section up into uh, four bite-sized pieces. Um, that, that includes problems that occur during the neonatal period, problems that typically present with bilious vomiting, and you should know that bilious vomiting is almost always a surgical problem. Uh, problems that occur a little bit later on in infancy and problems that occur uh, during the childhood period. Now, not all of the things that are talked about in these sections, and I want to stress this, not all the things that are talked about in each of these sections are restricted to uh, these categories. So there's some things that can present both in the neonatal period and it can present in the infancy period. And there's some things that can present with bilious vomiting that are also neonatal problems. And so not all of these uh, are solely uh, under one category, but uh, I try to divide them up pretty evenly. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk about Hirschsprung's disease, necrotizing enterocolitis, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, and intussusception for GI problems. And then we'll also talk about biliary atresia, which, as you can imagine, is a hepatobiliary disease. Hirschsprung's disease is an absence of ganglion cells, the mucosal and muscular layers of a segment of the colon. Uh, so what you have here is a lack of nerves, essentially, and that absence of nerves means that the colon can't relax Properly. And because it can't relax properly, it can't conduct the bolus of stool down the colon, and therefore the, the, the stool gets stuck. And, uh, and so that results in constipation. The incidence is somewhat common, 1 in 5,000. Uh, the predominance in boys about a 4 to 1 ratio. It's associated with genetic anomalies, particularly Down syndrome. And it tends to affect the rectosigmoidal area. So this is typically limited to the distal colon. And that's good because that makes the surgery a little bit easier. It means you don't have to take out as much colon. 80% are limited to the rectosigmoidal area, the so-called short segment disease. About 15% extend to the pro uh, proximal to the sigmoid, and that's a little bit longer since that's involving the entire sigmoid colon. And so that's called long segment disease, and less than 5%, a small minority, involve the entire colon, and this is a familial syndrome, uh, typically not as associated with genetic anomalies. This is something that's passed down in families. So the symptoms of Hirschsprung's disease uh, most classically include failure to pass meconium within 24 hours of birth. Uh, so that's one thing that you should be looking for in the patient's history. Vomiting, abdominal distension, reluctance to feed, uh, those are all associated with the constipation, the chronic constipation. Enterocolitis can develop, and that's going to include fever, bloody stools, explosive diarrhea. And then when you go to do your physical exam, you'll note an empty rectal vault because stool is not getting down there as much as it should. Uh, sometimes, however, because when you do the digital rectal exam, you're uh, manipulating the rectum and sort of manually relaxing the rectum, uh, you can get a release of the backed up stool and flatus on your exam. Uh, as the child gets older, uh, they'll start to have bouts of alternating constipation and diarrhea, and then uh, once they hit toilet training age, typically it's constipation alone. So for diagnosis, the most accurate test is a rectal biopsy. However, when you have a baby who is having constipation, abdominal distension, uh, Hirschsprung's disease is in your differential, but it's not the only thing in your differential. And you kind of want to do the most general tests so that you can eliminate as many things as possible. And so the first thing that you're going to want to do, or the first two things that you're going to want to do, uh, in addition to your labs, uh, are contrast enema and abdominal radiographs. Because there's lots of things that can cause constipation in a newborn or in uh, a neonate. Uh, think of duodenal atresia, colonic atresia, jejunal ileal atresia, uh, meconium ileus, 
So there's, there's lots of things that can be behind this. So the best first step would be to do a contrast enema and abdominal radiographs. Those should be ordered first. So what are we differentiating this from? Well, first off, there's the small left colon syndrome. We're thinking about this primarily in neonates that have failed to pass meconium. And so small left colon syndrome is a disorder where, unlike in Hirschsprung's disease, in small left colon syndrome, the tissue is normal. The left colon tissue is normal. It has ganglia. It can function properly. The problem is it's not functioning properly. It's not relaxing properly, but it has all the equipment to function. Whereas in Hirschsprung's disease, you don't have the ganglia, so you, you, you cannot function properly without the ganglia because you need that to get your neuronal input. With small left colon syndrome, you have a left colon that's just simply refusing to function. Uh, this is something that you should consider, especially in infants of diabetic mothers, as well as infants of mothers who've uh, received magnesium sulfate for some period of time. So a mother that has had preeclampsia and has been on bed rest and getting magnesium sulfate intravenously, that's a possibility. Uh, contrast enema will show a narrow entire left colon, and that really helps you to sort of tease this apart because with Hirschsprung's disease, typically it is confined to the rectosigmoidal area in 80% of cases. Even in that additional 15%, it only goes to the proximal sigmoid, uh, or just distal to the sigmoid, rather. And uh, with small left colon syndrome, this will go all the way up to the splenic flexure. However, the best way to differentiate small left colon syndrome from Hirschsprung's is to get that rectal biopsy. With small left colon syndrome, you will see ganglia, whereas in Hirschsprung's you won't. Retentive constipation is more of a uh, behavioral problem. So these patients have a history of issues with continence. They may have uh, problems with soiling their pants, uh, along with also uh, problems with constipation, difficulty with toilet training. Physical exam will, unlike with Hirschsprung's disease, will reveal a dilated rectal vault, usually because there's impaction. There's stool getting onto the sides of the rectal vault, unable to ex escape through the anus. And so uh, usually you'll see impaction uh, with patients with retentive constipation. And what happens is that the stool gets... Uh, retained in, in, in on the sides of the rectal vault and it becomes hard and because it's hard it's very painful to pass and um, so the child learns to hold it and it just gets worse. Uh, so uh, another thing you might see is an abdominal mass in the left lower quadrant and they palpate that and that's a fecal mass and you're feeling that over the sigmoid. Okay so what else can you see? Hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism causes constipation in the old and young alike. So with hypothyroidism, anytime a patient has constipation, you should always think hypothyroidism in the back of your mind. Um, that goes for anybody, an 80-year-old or an 8-month-old. So the, with hypothyroidism, the thyroid function tests will be abnormal, and typically there will be other symptoms of hypothyroidism present. So intolerance to cold, uh, decreased appetite, brittle hair, brittle nails, dry skin, um, all of these things can be present. Weight gain. Cystic fibrosis, you should suspect on history, all babies in the U.S. are tested for cystic fibrosis. Uh, for the most part, especially if there's a family history, you may have a history of uh, meconium ileus. Eventually, you'll have failure to thrive, and there can be recurrent pulmonary infections. For diagnosis, uh, as I mentioned, the abdominal radiographs and contrast enema are going to be important uh, to do first, not only to look for Hirschsprung's disease, but to see if, uh, if it might be something else. But the most important and most accurate test that you ultimately have to do if you're going to make the diagnosis of Hirschsprung's is the rectal biopsy, uh, because it's only that that will demonstrate the pathognomonic lack of ganglia that we need to diagnose this. The treatment is a surgical resection of the aganglionic portion, so we determine which portion or portions in rare cases of the colon are aganglionic. Uh, 
and we take those parts out because it's those parts that are causing the stool to not process through the colon properly. And this can be done either by, by typically by diverting colostomy uh, or ileostomy, and that's followed uh, by a secondary takedown. Um, so you need to go to the bag for a while, let the, uh, let the distal portion heal, and then you can take that down and anastomose it. Uh, in some cases, it can be done by primary repair. Uh, you don't need to know which surgery to choose. Just know that with Hirschsprung's disease, the ultimate treatment is surgical resection of the egg anglionic portion. Complications can include fecal retention if you don't resect en enough of, if you don't get all the egg anglionic portion. Uh, incontinence can occur, uh, anastomotic breakdown. So remember that you're, uh, you're sewing up the two loose ends. So once you sew that up, it is at risk to break down and then you can get uh, peritonitis. Uh, you can get stricture from an elaboratory inflammatory response and then your general surgical complications. So here's Hirschsprung's disease and this is uh, restricted to the rectosigmoidal area. So you can see you've got contrast going up here and you have a somewhat dilated sigmoid, but a very, very uh, constricted um, rectal area. Necrotizing enterocolitis is of unclear etiology. However, the theory is that it's due to a hypoxic insult, a normal hypoxic insult um, in a premature infant, because this tends to occur in premature infant, uh, that doesn't have a mature immune system. And so normally we get these hypoxic episodes in the intestine, and those hypoxic episodes cause normal intestinal sloughing and with this normal intestinal sloughing, there's a normal bacterial invasion. We all have bacteria in our bodies. Bacteria invade our bodies all the time. But normally, our immune system is able to take control of it and uh, get rid of the bacteria, kill the bacteria, and nothing happens. The theory is that in premature infants, their immune system is not quite up to par yet. And so when they get these hypoxic episodes with intestinal sloughing and bacteria invades their bowel, the bacteria are actually able to colonize and create an inflammatory response. And it's that inflammatory response that ultimately can cause gangrene and perforation. And this is necrotizing enterocolitis. So this is almost always in premature infants. You can expect to see that in a vignette. Uh, this typically does not happen in term babies. The symptoms are intolerance to feeds, abdominal distension, bloody stools, vomiting, diarrhea, decreased bowel sounds to auscultation, and then erythema over the abdomen if there's peritonitis present. This is usually later on, and shock. And this is sudden. So this isn't something that's been going on for two, three, four days. This is something that's been going on probably for a few hours. The initial labs that you get, your routine labs, are useful. A CBC will typically show a thrombocytopenia. You can have an abnormal white count, either high or low. Um, but if you're in the process of going from a high to a low white count, it may be normal. So you can't always rely on that. And uh, a lot of times, there'll be a low hematocrit. Your metabolic panel will often show a low sodium and a metabolic acidosis, so a low bicarb. For diagnosis, the best initial step is an abdominal x-ray. Wow, that's so simple, isn't it? Just get an abdominal x-ray uh, for uh, to, to diagnose this. And actually, it is very simple because the abdominal x-ray shows some very, very typical pathognomonic signs of enter necrotizing enterocolitis. And so we really don't need to go any further. We don't need to do a barium or a would never do a barium enema. You don't need to do a contrast enema. Uh, you can diagnose necrotizing enterocolitis just based on abdominal x-ray. And when you have a baby with abdominal distension, an abdominal x-ray is a good place to go, really for anybody with abdominal distension. So the best initial step when you suspect necrotizing enterocolitis is an abdominal x-ray, especially because of that abdominal distension. Uh, 
And this will typically show dilated bowel, and the dilated bowel is dilated because uh, you've got a, uh, a slowing of, uh, of um, you basically have an ileus. Uh, so you've got slowing and gas accumulation, stool accumulation. There's edematous walls because of the inflammatory response bringing in fluid, uh, third spacing, and then most ominously, there's intramural air. And what that's caused from is the bacteria getting into the, uh, the lumen tissue in between the tissues that make up the lumen. And just the metabolic activity of the bacteria, it releases air, and so you can see air uh, in, in between the layers of the intestinal lumen. You should also be observant for signs of bowel perforation, so signs of, uh, of peritonitis, and uh, those things would be uh, things like uh, guarding, rebound tenderness, rigidity. Uh, and the reason for that is because perforation is an absolute indication for emergent surgery. We don't treat necrotizing enterocolitis surgically unless there's perforation uh, and a few other cases. But for the most part, we don't treat necrotizing enterocolitis surgically. However, if there is bowel perforation, then yes, we do treat it surgically. Uh, so signs of bowel perforation are something you really need to look out for once you've diagnosed necrotizing enterocolitis because if there is bowel perforation, then the patient needs emergent surgery. And so because you're looking for bowel perforation, because that's a concern in the patient with necrotizing enterocolitis, you should obtain your x-rays both in the AP view and in the left lateral decubitus view. Why? Because the left lateral decubitus view is the most sensitive radiograph to look for peritonitis, or to look for uh, pneumoperitoneum, pneumoperitoneum, air in the peritoneal space. So uh, if you just get an AP view, you may miss the fact that there's a little bit of air in the, pneumoperit in the, in the peritoneal space. And if you miss that, then that can be bad. So left lateral decubitus view uh, is the most sensitive way to diagnose pneumoperitoneum. So you want to get that left lateral decubitus view. Okay, so here's uh, an example of an x-ray of necrotizing enterocolitis. So some things that you can see uh, are most notably uh, this separation of the luminal wall. Uh, and so you can see, if you look hard enough here, maybe make this a full screen view so you can see it better, uh, you can see a little bit of separation between the layers of the lumen. Another thing that you can see, and I don't know if YouTube will make it easy for you to see this, but you can see this kind of modeling sort of salt and pepper uh, appearance of the liver. And this is because there's air getting into the biliary tract. Okay, so here's another uh, view. This one's a little bit more severe. So you can look up here, you definitely have separation of the luminal wall down here too. You also have the thumbprint sign, which I'll illustrate for you later. Again, here, you've got separation of the wall. Okay, so the football sign is something that you'd see in massive pneumoperitoneum. And what the football sign is, is if you look up at the liver, you can see this line on the liver, and that's because of air. And this is actually the falciform ligament. And then this thumb printing is due to large bowel edema. And so you can see these, it looks like somebody smudged their thumbprints all over this x-ray, but actually that's edema in the large bowel. So provided that there's no signs of perforation, the primary treatment is medical, and so what you're going to do is decompress the GI tract and of course put the patient on broad spectrum IV antibiotics. Because we're going to decompress the, end, uh, the GI tract, we're not having the patient have any feeds, we're stopping the feeds right away, of course they need to be on IV fluids and nutrition. The patient should be in the NICU uh, for serial abdominal x-rays every four hours because we're concerned about perforation and because we want to monitor their acidemia, typically they have it, as well as other metabolic parameters such as apnea and body temperature. Surgery is reserved for perforation, 
Uh, relative indications for surgery, uh, where you may consider it, are if there's worsening symptoms of peritonitis uh, or there's a failure to stabilize within 12 hours of presentation. And uh, the survival rate for necrotizing enterocolitis is actually pretty good. It's 80% for the patients that don't require surgery, 50% for patients who do require surgery. And we don't know if this, the survival for patients who require surgery is lower because they got surgery or if it was low, lower because they required surgery. We don't experiment like that. We don't do surgery on patients who don't need it to see if their survival is reduced. That would obviously be unethical. So because of that, we try to avoid surgery if possible. So hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is hypertrophy of the muscular layer of the pylorus, and this results in a gastric outlet syndrome. So that's pretty simple. Your pylorus hypertrophies, you don't have any room to get food through the stomach into the duodenum. And so because of that, the stomach fills up, the baby throws up the contents of the stomach. Typically, this presents between two weeks and two months of life. There's a four to one male preponderance. As we've seen in most of these, they're male preponderance. It's also increased in firstborn babies, and it's increased risk if the parent has a history of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis when they were a baby. So there's a genetic component as well. The symptoms, classically, this is a projectile non-bilious vomiting. So why is it non-bilious? Because they're throwing stuff up from the stomach. It's not from the duodenum, it's from the stomach. And so there's no bile in, in, in that content. Uh, but this is followed by a desire to feed because the baby's really not getting a lot of food into the intestine where it can absorb the nutrients. So the baby's still hungry. And so the baby will vomit and then they'll want to eat again. Symptoms consistent with dehydration will almost always be present, as would be with any case with frequent vomiting. There may be quote-unquote constipation, and the, a lot of times that gets reported as constipation. I put that in quotes there because a lot of times the parent will say, well, my baby it, it isn't pooping. Well, the reason your baby's not pooping is because they're not getting any food into their in, into their their bowel so that's going to reduce the stool uh, so that's something that you may hear from parent uh, labs will be consistent with hypokalemic hypo, hypochloremic metabolic acid alkalosis so you're losing hydrogen ions which would be in your stomach acid you're losing chloride which would be in the uh, stomach acid as well and you're also losing potassium so hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis. Uh, another thing that the USMLE will probably throw at you, but it's not always reliable in real life, is this palpable olive-like nodular mass over the epigastric to right upper quadrant area. So if you can palpate that, that's a really sensitive or a really specific sign of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis in the correct setting. Uh, however, this is not the, the the absence of this not being able to feel this is doesn't rule pyloric stenosis out because you may not be able to feel it. You might not be feeling in the right place. Uh, so this isn't absolutely necessary. Um, so if you do feel that all of like mass and the patient has a history of projectile non bilious vomiting and they've got the labs that are consistent, you can pretty much make the diagnosis clinically. But because of the uh, sort of uh, the loss of the art of uh, the physical exam, uh, usually we like to get abdominal sonography or contrast study to confirm the diagnosis before we go in and do surgery. So uh, an abdominal sonography usually will be able to uh, will be able to see this this mass, and it's really not so much a mass as much as it's just uh, it's just hypertrophied tissue. Uh, or the upper GI contrast study will show that there's an outlet uh, syndrome, and so either of those can be useful to confirm the diagnosis. So here you can see an outlet syndrome. So you've got contrast in the stomach, but hardly anything getting into the duodenum. 
And this would be like right where your mass would be. Because this would be the hypertrophied pyloric tissue. And here's another one. So you can see uh, it's in the stomach here. And then you've got this area, just this little string here. And then gets into the duodenum, but not a lot. And so, again, this area in between would be where your hypertrophied tissue is. And that would be where your mass would be if you were to feel it. So the best first step in treatment is to correct the dehydration and the electrolyte and metabolic abnormalities that are almost certainly there. So we never take a patient into surgery who's dehydrated or has electrolyte abnormalities. Uh, I should say we never take them in for elective surgery if they're like that. Uh, but uh, if we have the opportunity to correct dehydration and electrolyte and metabolic abnormalities before surgery, we always do. And so that's the best first step. Uh, and always, babies with pyloric stenosis are going to have some dehydration issues uh, or electrolyte issues. So generally, this is going to involve administering at least a bolus of normal saline and potassium to get the potassium and normal uh, and, and the volume levels up to a normal level. And we determine that it's at a normal level by monitoring the urinary output. So you can attach a Foley catheter in uh, and measure the urinary output. For children, the normal urinary output is one milligram per kilogram per day. So you can divide that up into 24 hours, how much it should be per hour, and you can see if the baby's putting out the appropriate amount of urine. And that ensures adequate hydration. And then this can be followed then by the surgical correction. And the surgical correction is called a pylor pyloromyotomy. And pyloromyotomy is an incision of the serosa of the pylorus. So this is typically done laparoscopically and you're just making an incision, a division over the serosa of the pylorus. So you're not even entering the stomach. You're only making an incision along the, uh, the muscle of the, the antrum. And uh, once this is divided, you've pretty much done your job. Uh, most importantly, the duodenum should not be disrupted because if the duodenum is disrupted, it's ruptured and that is going to result in all sorts of problems. So that's, and that's actually one of the major complications. Uh, so this is just an incision of the serosa over the pylorus and it divides the muscle of the antrum. Uh, following surgery, you can start giving Pedialyte at about four to six hours and full feeds can be started at 24 hours provided there's no complication. There's going to be post-operative vomiting in about 50 to 80% of patients, and that's typically due to gastric atony. Because you've just kind of sliced a little bit of the stomach, the stomach is kind of stunned, and so it's not going to empty because the stomach is stunned. Uh, and so that can cause some vomiting, but this is self-limited. So there will be some post-operative vomiting in the majority of patients, but that tends to go away pretty quickly. The major complications are apnea, and so all patients should be on an apnea monitor uh, while they're staying overnight post-operatively. And then duodenal perforation. This needs to be noted during surgery because once you sew the baby back up, the only way you're going to find out there's a duodenal perforation is the baby spikes a fever and you do contrast studies uh, or an x-ray. So uh, this needs to be noted during surgery. And if a duodenal perforation is noted during surgery, it can be easily repaired during the surgery. And then you'll administer IV antibiotics and NG decompression after the operation. So here's a pyloromyotomy. So it's just a division of that outer surface. Intussusception is a telescopic invagination of bowel lumen, typically uh, the distal small intestine, uh, proximal large intestine. We're talking terminal ileum here. And then this results in an obstruction. And it's uniformly fatal if not treated. The uh, prevalence of this is 1 in 2,000. So again, this is we're talking about a pretty common uh, entity. Two-thirds of cases happen under one year of age, but the rest of them happen later. There's a male preponderance of three uh, to eight to one. So again, 
male preponderance here. Usually intussusception is idiopathic. We don't know what was behind it after it happened, but it is associated with various conditions. And the three you really should remember are henoch shunlein purpura and bleeding disorders because they cause these little hematomas in uh, the tissue, uh, which can uh, work as these, uh, uh, I don't know what they call them, but they're areas where the tissue can hold on to and then that allows the tissue to invaginate, uh, allows the lumen to invaginate. Uh, so these two, because they cause those little hematomas, and then cystic fibrosis uh, can be a cause as well, as well as being overweight, and then the Meckel's diverticulum. And there's lots of other ones, uh, lots of other possible uh, causes, but uh, usually this is idiopathic. I would remember these first three, though. So the symptoms are a classic triad of these one to two minute long bouts of severe colicky abdominal pain, vomiting, and blood in the stool. And all of these symptoms have a progression. So they start out and they get more severe as time goes on. So the pain starts out as a severe colicky abdominal pain, and it usually lasts about one to two minutes. Usually the patient gets into the fetal position or they're kicking during the pain episodes, trying to get the pain to go away. But in between the episodes, they're fine. However, as this goes on, in between those episodes, there's going to be increasing lethargy. So you want to note how much lethargy is in between these episodes. As far as the vomiting, the vomiting begins as non-bilious, but eventually it will progress to bilious vomiting. And then as far as blood in the stool, initially it, there's diarrhea, and then it becomes occult blood positive. And then this progresses into that stereotypical uh, current jelly stool, uh, which is blood, mucus, and sloughed off mucosa. And that's what causes that appearance. So all of these progress, and it's usually over a period of about 16 to 24 hours uh, that you go from uh, the beginning to some of the more severe end-stage symptoms. Other symptoms include abdominal distension, and that's because the intussusception causes an obstruction, so that causes distension. And then later on, uh, if, once you get a perforation, which is always going to happen uh, in, at the end, you'll get peritonitis, fever, and shock, and that's ultimately what will kill the child if you don't treat this timely enough. So the labs are usually unremarkable. However, leukocytosis will come in in the late stages once you start getting the peritonitis. If ordered, an abdominal x-ray will probably show loops of small bowel, and that's uh, just proximal to the obstruction, and that's because you've got a blockage. And so there's going to be dilated loops of small bowel as any small bowel obstruction. Uh, if there's perforation, then certainly uh, you may be able to see subdiaphragmatic air. Sonography is usually performed, and although this is not the best test to do, it is a very sensitive and specific test to do, and in practice, you will almost certainly be doing sonography on a patient where you suspect intussusception, because you can do it quickly, and if you see the, the classic signs, you can almost guarantee yourself that it is indeed intussusception. And what you see is what's called the target sign. I'll show you a bunch of pictures of that. For diagnosis, the best diagnostic test when suspecting intussusception is an air uh, or contrast enema. And I should say I would avoid using barium here. So air enema would probably be the best. Uh, so you use an air contrast enema. Uh, and this is the reason that this is the best diagnostic test is it's both diagnostic and when you're doing it, it usually will also cure the intussusception as well uh, because that air is going to push that telescoping lumen back down into its correct place uh, or the fluid, whatever you're using for your contrast. If the patient has symptoms consistent with perforation, and this is why it's so important to always know if the patient has peritoneal signs, um, or if the contrast enema fails, then you should do surgical reduction uh, rather than the enema. And the patient should be admitted for 24 hours of observation at least, as about 10% of cases of intussusception will recur.
So here's a target sign. So what you have here, uh, this black, these black arrows are the, uh, the distal vowel, and coming through here is the telescoping vowel. And so you have a target sign. It's like a, looks kind of like a, uh, like a dartboard. Here's another one. And then this is kind of looking at it along the side. So we're looking at it at a 90 degree angle now. And so you see, kind of looks like a sausage shaped, uh, and actually I think the intussusception is classically called a sausage shaped mass. So you can kind of see it looks like a, sort of like a sausage shape. Here's another one. This is the telescoping bowel going into the distal bowel. Here's a contrast enema. You can really see it beautifully on here. Uh, you've got your bowel here and then your uh, intussuscepting bowel right here, which doesn't light up because you're not, you're not going into this bowel here. There's, this is a, a blind end here. So you can see the intussusception there. And then there's another one here. This is the intussuscepting portion, and this is the bowel filling up with contrast. This is a negative, so the, the uh, lumen appears black with contrast. And here's another one. This is a little bit smaller here. All right, we'll finish with biliary atresia. This is a progressive developmental disorder of the biliary ductal system, and this affects proper biliary drainage. This tends to have a higher occurrence in Asians, and unlike all the other ones we were talking about, this has a slight female preponderance, and it is the number one cause of neonatal and infant liver disease. The classic symptom of biliary atresia is persistent jaundice beyond the first month of life. Jaundice within the first few weeks of life is quite common, and usually it's, it's nothing to be concerned about. However, beyond one month of life, it's something to worry about. Um, otherwise, though, the baby is healthy appearing. There may be pale stools and dark urine, and that's because you're not getting bile into the intestine. Uh, and by six months of age, there will be failure to thrive because they're not getting proper absorption of fats because they don't have the, the, the bile to uh, emulsify them. And later on, they'll start to be signs of liver failure uh, because of the cholestasis. Uh, and that's going to include portal hypertension, esophageal varices, uh, pruritus, and bleeding uh, because of the uh, liver failure, not making the factors. Labs will demonstrate a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And conjugated hyperbilirubinemia is never normal in a baby. Uh, the normal hyperbilirubinemia we see in babies, the uh, sort of non-pathologic uh, hyperbilirubinemia, if you will, uh, is uh, an unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. With biliary atresia, you'll note a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia. And that would be where the direct bilirubin is more than 2 milligrams per deciliter or more than 20% of the total bilirubin. Uh, what you'll also note in most cases is an elevation of alkaline phosphatase as well as uh, possibly an elevation of the transaminases. And this is usually once you start to get to the later stages where there's cholestatic liver failure. The best initial step when you suspect biliary atresia is to rule out other causes of persistent neonatal jaundice. So those include um, three or maybe four things that should be at the front of your mind of persistent neonatal jaundice in addition to biliary atresia. And that's going to be torch infections, which a lot of times that's going to be obvious when, uh, uh, when the baby is born. There's certain features of congenital rubella, of congenital toxoplasmosis. Uh, so torch infection, you'll want to do titers for those. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, cystic fibrosis, and cholidocal cysts. So the workup would include torch titers to look for the torch infection, alpha-1 antitrypsin levels, and a sweat chloride level.
Once uh, you've done all that, you can also do an ultrasound to rule out cholecystitis. Once you've done all that and you've ruled out all of those things, then you can do a HIDA scan. And remember, a HIDA scan is used to look at the biliary tract. Now, in the child, the, the infant with biliary atresia, we add phenobarbital, or we give them phenobarbital for five days before their HIDA scan. The reason is that phenobarbital is a really strong choleretic, and so this strengthens the accuracy of the test. Phenobarbital should make you secrete more bile into your intestine. And so if there is no secretion of bile into the intestine, even with the administration of phenobarbital, we're even more sure that it's biliary atresia. So once you've worked, uh, once you've excluded all the, these other causes, torch, alpha-1 antitrypsin, cystic fibrosis, and choleidocal cysts, then you perform a phenobarbital HIDA scan. And in biliary atresia, there should be no excretion of bile into the intestine at 24 hours. If the HIDA scan is consistent with biliary atresia, then the best next step is to do surgery. And what you're doing is a diagnostic laparoscopy with an intraoperative cholangiogram. And this is to visualize the biliary tract inside and to get an external look at the biliary tract because that's going to dictate what kind of surgery we do to treat the biliary atresia. So there's three different ways that your diagnostic laparoscopy can come back. One, you have a normal patent biliary system. And in this case, the problem is pr probably in the liver, and so you should obtain a wedge biopsy of the liver. But you're always going to get a wedge biopsy of the liver when you do this diagnostic laparoscopy. So you should get the wedge biopsy of the liver if you've got a normal patent biliary system. If you have a non-patent biliary system, but you have a sufficient hepatic duct, there is something that resembles a hepatic duct, what you can do is uh, pull the intestine up and make a conduit that will then connect that hepatic duct into the intestine. And by doing that, you now have a drainage space for the bile to go through. And so now you'll, uh, you, you won't have uh, your problems anymore. So uh, that's called a portoenterostomy. You're making a, a conduit between the, uh, the hepatic duct and the, uh, the intestine. If you have a non-patent biliary system without a sufficient hepatic duct, then you're going to do what's called a Kasai procedure, which is technically known as a hepatoportal enterostomy. Uh, and this is where you take the intestine and rather than uh, anastomosing it to part of a hepatic duct, since you don't have any hepatic duct, you're actually going to pull it up to where the, uh, the common bile duct would come out. Uh, and I'll show, you a, I'll show you a picture of that so that makes more sense. Um, but the Kasai procedure would be what you would do if you have a non-patent biliary system without a sufficient hepatic duct. Uh, I think I have a picture of it. Yeah, okay. So here's, uh, so here they're taking part of the intestine here, right? So they split the intestine, uh, the small intestine, and they took the uh, distal part and they brought it up here to the liver, and the theory is that there's enough small ductules that you can drain enough bile from the liver. You also take the gallbladder out, too, uh, so because uh, that's not really going to do anything for you. You don't have a duct to connect it to anything. So you're taking intestine and just wiring it right into the liver. And then you take that proximal portion of the... Uh, I don't know if they use duodenum or jejunum. I think they use jejunum. Um, but you take that proximal portion and, uh, and anastomose that back onto, your, uh, uh, back onto that uh, intestine that was going in uh, to the liver. So that's the Kasai procedure. And so you can see how that physiologically would work. But you don't need to know how to do the procedure for the test. Just, I just want you to have an idea of what why this, this works.
So the prognosis is based on the age at surgery and on that biopsy result. So that's another big reason why we're getting that biopsy. So there's optimal uh, prognosis if the surgery is performed around or before 8 to 12 weeks. The younger, the better, because the longer you go with this, the more cholestasis you have, the more liver damage you're going to have. And remember, we're already kind of working with a problematic bile duct system. Uh, so we don't want there to be any uh, residual liver damage. So optimal prognosis if the surgery is performed before 8 to 12 weeks. Other uh, uh, studies I've seen have said before 40 days, but basically the earlier the better. And then there's a better prognosis if there's larger intrahepatic ducts on biopsy. So the larger the intrahepatic ducts get on your biopsy, then you know that there is more of a hepatic ductular system present, uh, even though it's intrahepatic, there's more of a system present for you to drain into this, uh, this new conduit. And so that's also, whoops, I don't know, let me get out of here. That's also associated with, uh, with a better prognosis. One third of all surgeries are going to be successful in the long term. The rest are going to require a transplant. And this is, biliary atresia is the number one reason for a pediatric liver transplant. In the meantime, supportive care would include fat-soluble vitamin supplementation since they're not able to absorb fats through their, uh, their diet as well as others. Uh, monitoring their vitamin levels, so those are their A, D, E, and K. Formula that includes medium chain triglycerides. And then also to be aware of infection, particularly ascending cholangitis, and manage bleeding with intramuscular vitamin K.